In 4.2, we are looking at world's access to fresh water. Um, right now, our freshwater resources are inequitably available and unevenly distributed, which has led to water scarcity and conflict between nations. Um, however, we can sustainably manage our freshwater resources if we use a variety of different approaches, which we're going to take a look at today. Um, in this diagram, you can see the total use by country. It's represented by the circles. Uh, China and India, which have the largest population, have a large demand, which makes sense. However, if you look at the U.S., we also have a large demand, yet we have many fewer people than China and India. Um, as world population has increased, we need more water for irrigation to produce food. Um, the use of water in indus industry has increased. Um, but our supplies have also become more limited because they are becoming contaminated. There are several things that we can do to enhance our water supplies, which we are going to look at today. Um, in addition to using reservoirs, desalinization, recharging aquifers, we can also increase our conservation efforts, um, which helps to reduce the demand, but that will require a change in attitude by the water consumers. We've looked at building dams and reservoirs as a way to increase um, water use, and we've already discussed some of the advantages and disadvantages. Um, it is cheap, constant electricity. Um, it can control downstream flooding. It stores water year-round and provides recreation. However, to create the reservoir, people are displaced. Aquatic ecosystems are disrupted um, by the flooding, uh, which also... Um, when we create the reservoir with that large body of water, it's going to increase the amount that we lose due to evaporation, especially in the summertime. Um, in addition, the dams also block sediment from uh, carrying nutrients downstream to the floodplains, which also causes the reservoirs to become more shallow over time, and that can slow water flow as well. Um, <clears throat> most rivers that have dams usually have multiple dams. Um, and ultimately what happens is that the river can slow to a trickle and no longer reach the ocean. It's not as big of a problem on the East Coast because we have plenty of rainfall, but on the West Coast, like the Colorado River, um, it now runs dry. In Southeast Asia, the Ganges and the Indus Rivers run dry seasonally. If we look at the Colorado River Basin, um, it covers seven states, and each of those states have built dams to create reservoirs. The one shown in the picture here is Lake Mead behind the Hoover Dam. Because it's in a very dry area, the water levels have dropped significantly. Um, also, as more and more people move into those areas, we're increasing our water usage. In China, uh, the largest dam in the world was completed in 2013. Um, the good thing is China has very poor air quality, and by building this dam, it provides the electricity equivalent to 18 coal-burning power plants, which helps with the air quality and reduces China's dependence on coal. Um, the way the dam is built, it still, still allows for larger ships to enter the interior through a system of locks that raise the ships to the reservoir level. Um, and it also prevents floods that historically have killed over 500,000 people. However, with a project this large, close to 2 million people were relocated. Um, towns that had historical significance were covered by the reservoir. The ecosystem has changed. And the dam is also built over a seismic fault. So there is risk that there could be a very destructive flood downstream. And it was a very expensive project. Um, Instead of building reservoirs, we can also transport water or transfer it from one location to another using tunnels, aqueducts, canals, pipes. Um, one of the areas that is known for doing this is California, moving water from um, the wet northern California to the dry, arid regions of southern California. Um, this is California's water system, and you can see the three aqueducts up here transfer water from one part of California to another, from higher elevations to the coast. Um, however, we still have one Colorado, 
Colorado River aqueduct that provides the water for San Diego. Um, Mono Lake is in Northern California. In 1941, um, water was diverted from the streams that fed this lake to the LA aqueduct, and the the lake has shrunk in half, the salinity has gone up, and the ecosystem began to fail. Now that they, the state and courts have mandated raising the level of the lake 20 feet, but that'll take about 20 years. You can see the salt along the coastline of what was once a freshwater lake. If we go back to this diagram, here is Mono Lake, and it was providing the water for Los Angeles. So not only was the lake shrinking in size, but a lot of that water was lost due to evaporation as it was being transferred. The Colorado River Aqueduct, going back to our map, that carries water from Colorado River Basin over to San Diego is an open air aqueduct in a very dry region. So we are gonna lose um, some of that to evaporation. This one was built in 1928. And at one time it also provided water for LA and other parts of Southern California. Uh, when it first started carrying the water after it was constructed in 1940, it carried water for 15 million people. In 1953, Arizona had a lawsuit against California um, for the amount of water they were withdrawing, and so that's why they started the state water project where they were carrying water from Northern California to Southern California. San Diego still uses an aqueduct, but the amount of water that they have withdrawn from the Colorado has um, significantly decreased. The Aral Sea is another area where we have seen uh, water diversion projects um, significantly decrease the water that's in that area. It was once the world's fourth largest freshwater lake, but beginning in 1960, um, they started growing cotton and rice in this region, which is dry to start with, and those are uh, water-intensive crops. So they were taking water from two of the rivers that fed into the Aral Sea. So in that picture there, you can see the red outline is the size that the Aral Sea once was and how much it has decreased. Um, this large-scale water diversion project, in addition to the um, droughts and evaporation because of the dry climate, um, has caused huge problems in the ecology of the area um, and has also caused health problems uh, with the toxins that are surrounding the lake. And here's two um, aerial views, one in 1989 and one in 2003. And you can see, once again, similar to Mono Lake, the salts that surround the water. Um, so we lost 85% of the wetlands surrounding Aral Sea, which really affects our birds. Um, the increasing of salt concentration decreases the fish populations um, and toxic contaminants in the watershed, so that's led to human health problems. So because of that, in 1999, United Nations and the World Bank stepped in. They spent about $600 million dollars to help with water purification and upgrade some of the irrigation systems to help reduce the amount of water that was withdrawn. Um, in addition to transferring water and building dams and reservoirs, one option is to remove salt from seawater. That's called desalination. It's a very expensive way to get fresh water, so it's only done in a few areas around the world. There's not many places in the U.S. that do it. There are several in Florida. Um, most desalinization plants are in the Middle East. Um, so it, it does provide drinking water in areas where there's no natural supply of potable or drinkable water. Um, but it does require a lot of energy to remove the salt, which creates thermal pollution. Um, it's very expensive. And you also have chemical and brine waste once you remove the water. And you can see in the diagram here the salt and the minerals that are put back into the ocean, which then in turn takes even more energy to remove the salt. Another thing that we can do is to artificially recharge aquifers. Because we are overdrawing our groundwater, our water table is dropping, as you can see here. So if we could pump water down into those aquifers, we can raise the water table. So this is beneficial to arid regions like the Middle East once again, but also the American Southwest where we are really overdrawing our aquifers. Um, there's very little natural recharge because those areas are dry, so we can't depend on rainfall to raise our water table. Um, this method is much less expensive than building dams because we're reducing the amount 
um, of construction, people being displaced, maintenance. It also helps with evaporation loss. We don't lose groundwater to evaporation. Um, and then to recharge our aquifers, we can use treated wastewater and allow the ground to naturally filter it. We can use stormwater runoff. Um, Flood waters can be pumped back into the ground, but anytime we are pumping water into the ground, we run the risk of contamination. And aquifers take decades or even centuries sometimes to be purified once there is a toxin in place. We also don't know what the long term implications of this because this is a relatively new technique, um, yet, it's something that has been successful and will probably increase um, over time. Other things that we can do, collecting rainwater, which can help reduce demand on existing water, also helps reduce runoff and erosion. Um, it can be used for a variety of things, uh, watering your landscape, help control stormwater, can water livestock. If you're using it in your home, you need some sort of treatment method in place. It can also be used for fire protection. Um, disadvantages, once again, I mentioned that it needs to be treated if you're using it um, for household use. Uh, you can't always depend on precipitation, rainfall is unpredictable, and there's storage limits to how much you can store as well. Now, because of water shortages in some of these areas, like the Middle East, um, which also has one of the world's highest population growth rates, we are facing water shortages. Most of the water in this area comes from the Nile, um, which runs through Egypt and uh, Sudan and Ethiopia but also up here the Tigris and Euphrates. So the countries are in disagreement over who has right because these rivers run through multiple countries. And right now there's no cooperative um, agreements for use of 158 of the world's 263 water basins. So that's not just a, an issue in the Middle East, but in other parts of the world as well.